Silverstein v. Federal Bureau of Prisons. This case concerns the Eighth Amendment, which protects against cruel and unusual punishment. Thomas Silverstein, better known as Terrible Tommy, was long considered to be the most dangerous prisoner in America. He was a high-ranking member of the Aryan Brotherhood, and he killed four men during his incarceration. For these reasons, he earned another title, the most isolated person in the world. In fact, that was the reason for the lawsuit that he filed against the Bureau of Prisons. When he filed his lawsuit in Denver District Court, he had been in solitary confinement for 24 years. He was represented by the students at the Civil Rights Clinic at DU Sturm College of Law. In 2011, District Court Judge Philip Brimmel ruled that Silverstein's conditions were not atypically extreme. Silverstein appealed his case. In 2014, the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed the lower court's ruling. Tom was raised in Long Beach, California by his mother, Virginia, and her husband, Sid. Sid would adopt Tom as his son, giving him his last name of Silverstein. Tom was introverted and an outcast. He was bullied by his classmates because they mistakenly believed him to be Jewish. His mother advised Tom to stand up for himself and fight back. At the age of 14, Tom was sentenced to the California Youth Authority. Tom was sentenced to San Quentin for armed robbery at the age of 19 and was released four years later on parole. Tom made the acquaintance of a man named Thomas Conway. He was Silverstein's biological father. Conway shared his vast wisdom with his son, teaching Silverstein about bank robbery. They pulled off three bank heists before they were arrested. This is where the court decision begins with a review of Silverstein's incarceration history in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. In 1977, Silverstein was sentenced to 15 years for armed robbery. He was sent to the Federal Penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kansas. This is when he began his association with the Aryan Brotherhood. In 1980, he murdered fellow inmate Danny Atwell because he refused to act as a mule in their drug smuggling operation. Silverstein was convicted of murder and given a sentence of life without parole. He was transferred to the control unit at the U.S. Penitentiary in Marion, Illinois. This is where the inmates deemed to be management problems were sent. The control unit was solitary confinement for the worst of the worst inmates in the federal prison system. The biggest rival of the Aryan Brotherhood was a gang called the DC Blacks. Not surprisingly, DC Black members were also housed in the control unit. Robert Chappelle was one of them. In 1981, Chappelle was murdered. Silverstein was accused of killing him and was temporarily moved from the prison during his trial. While he was away, the leader of the DC Blacks, Raymond Lee Cadillac Smith, transferred to the control unit. Silverstein was found guilty and given another life sentence. Then he was sent back to Marion. Smith wanted revenge for Chappelle's death. Despite his conviction, Silverstein has always denied killing Chappelle. The jury didn't believe him and neither did Cadillac Smith. He let everyone know he intended to kill Silverstein, but he didn't. Rather, it was Silverstein who killed Cadillac, stabbing him 67 times, then dragging his lifeless body behind him as he paraded up and down in front of the other prisoner's cells, making sure that the other prisoners could see how he handled Cadillac's threats. As you'd expect, Silverstein was given another life sentence. Restrictions on Silverstein became harsher. Twice a week, Silverstein could take a shower, but getting there required handcuffs, shackles, and an escort of three prison guards. In October of 1983, he was on the way to the shower. Silverstein paused briefly in front of the cell of another inmate. He removed Silverstein's handcuffs with a homemade key and then gave him a shank, which he used to murder prison guard Merle Klutz, stabbing him 40 times. This murder is so infamous, it's literally a textbook case. Later the same day, another inmate did the exact same thing as Silverstein, and another prison guard was murdered. Marion was immediately put on lockdown as a security precaution, and it would remain in place for the next 23 years. That wasn't the only reason this event was monumental.
Who are you? Who are you? <laughs> Who are you? Are you the beast that has left me in a cell for nearly 40 years? Are you the BOP? Are you the warden? Are you the BOP director? Who are you that asked me such a question? But because you've asked, I'll tell you who I am. I am a man who has been held in solitary confinement for the past 10,228 days, which is 336 months and or 28 years. I am a man who has spent more than half of his life in solitary confinement. I, sir, am Thomas Edward Silverstein. Register number 14634-116. At the age of 67 years old on May 11, 2019, I said goodbye to this forever pain, taking my last breath, bound and shackled by your system of justice. At the time of this writing, it had been 28 years. You can add on another eight before I die that I was left in this cell. Why did you do what you did, Mr. Silverstein? You want an answer? I want an answer as to why you left me locked in a cell for nearly 40 years with no compassion, with no remorse. Why did you leave me locked in a cell when it was clear that I had been rehabilitated, that I had changed my character, when it was clear that I was no longer a threat to the safety or security of any facility? Why did you leave me like this? Why have you locked so many men just like me up in a cage, left alone to suffer? Because the punishment was long done, many years ago. But instead, you continued to inflict punishment. The nature and impact of the harsh conditions I have endured in spite of a spotless conduct record for over 22 years, and my lack of knowledge about what, if anything, I can do to lessen my isolation. Nevertheless, I feel it would be disrespectful to say anything about my conditions of confinement without beginning with an apology for the actions that brought me here in the first place. An apology for the harm I have done is necessary before anything else can be said. Not a single one of the thousand days I have been here has gone by where I have not regretted the actions that brought me here. Every day, I think back and wish I had not killed Officer Klutz. I know that some people will continue to find this hard to believe, but I want it to be understood that it is not only because of my confinement that I feel this regret. I feel this way because I know what I did was wrong. I have become a person who recognizes and respects the value of the life of another. People can and do change. I know I have. And I have become someone who is deeply sorry for having done such terrible harm to others. I saw the Klutz family once at my sentencing hearing. Until that moment, I had never thought of Officer Klutz as having a family. As soon as I saw his children, I recognized that I had hurt more people than just Officer Klutz. I wondered about his kids regularly and hoped that they are okay and have been able to start families of their own. I have apologized publicly via my blog to Officer Klutz's children. I know his daughter saw my apology because she replied on the blog. Although I apologized, I would never have presumed to ask for their forgiveness, as what I did to them was unforgivable. But I wish for it just the same, and I wish I could repair the damage that I have done to other people's lives. I also regret my actions because they have harmed my own children. They have suffered because their father was not there for them. There's almost nothing as difficult and painful as knowing your children are suffering and knowing that you are the cause. I feel guilty about this every day, and when I feel pain for having not been there for my own children, I know that I also did this to Officer Klutz's children. I am the reason they, like my own children, grew up without a father, and I'm sorry for that. When I look back now, it is hard for me to understand how I made the choices I did. There is no justification for my actions. I wish I could go back and stop myself, though I know this is impossible. I recognize the pain I have caused others, including my own family and children. And in response to that, I have worked hard to become a different man. 
Although I cannot repair the damage I caused, I am committed to nonviolence. It is a promise I have made to myself and one that I hope honors those I have hurt. It is a promise I have every intention of keeping. I understand that I deserve to be punished for my actions, and I do not expect ever to be released from prison. My hope is simply to be allowed, like other prisoners, to earn the privileges that are warranted by my consistent good conduct. I do not consider myself to be part of any prison gang, nor do I want to be part of any prison gang. I just want to serve out the remainder of my time peacefully with other mature guys doing their time. The BOP has singled me out and treated me differently. Although the Federal Bureau of Prisons suggests that I am irrational to think that they are singling me out, I do not agree. I believe that is what they have been doing, and I can understand why they would do it. I believe I have been treated worse than any prisoner in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. I read in Dr. Haney's report that I am the most isolated prisoner he has ever seen. It sometimes seems that the BOP is trying to test me, to provoke bad behavior so that they can justify their treatment of me. For example, when mentally ill people who scream all night are placed in my unit, it feels like the BOP is trying to see if they can make me break a rule. I tolerate the incessant noise, though, because I don't want to break the rules. I want to earn my way out of solitary. I also believe that the BOP has purposely put known informants in cells and recreation areas around me in order to see if they can discover any negative information about me. But there is nothing to know, as I am simply trying to follow the rules. Since I have had clear conduct for decades, I do not know why I would continue to be held in isolation, except for the BOP's desire to make me suffer. For decades, year after year, I have tried to demonstrate that I am no longer the man I was in Marion. I have done, and continue to do, everything I can think of and all that the Bureau has asked to show I have changed and should be given relief from my isolation. I follow the rules. I am respectful and polite. I watch the programs they tell me to see. I have tried in every way I can think of to demonstrate that I have no intentions to ever hurt anyone. In addition to these efforts I have made, there is another reality I hope will be considered. I am quickly becoming an old man. I spend most of my days crocheting items for my family and my legal counsel and working on my artwork. It's hard to reconcile the BOP's description of me as frightening and scary. When the people who see me here know I am a man peering through bifocals, trying to count the number of stitches to make an afghan. Although I think the way some officers have treated me is a violation of BOP rules, I understand why they act this way. I imagine it is a way for them to feel loyal to Officer Klutz. Even though it was very painful that no one would talk to me, I understand why people might act the way, that way out of loyalty and also out of anger and fear. I know that some people, including Dr. Buzajan, have suggested that my good behavior is a ruse, that I have been a model prisoner for 22 years only because I am waiting to have my restrictions lessened so I can lash out violently. They also say that I haven't acted out because I can't, that my conditions are so restrictive that there's nothing I could do. But this is just not true. I could have yelled at or been disrespectful to or spit at the officers. I could have disobeyed an order or withheld my food tray or violated communication rules. I didn't and don't do any of these things. It's hard, if not impossible, for me to prove what is actually in my mind and what is not. All I can do is ask that others look to my current behavior and explain that it reflects my intention to never act violently again, ever. I know the consequences, both to myself and others, that will follow. And, more importantly, I know that this is not who I wish to be. My actions for the past 28 years are an expression of who I am and who I wish to be. When they took me from Leavenworth and put me in the van to move me here to the ADX, I thought I might finally be getting out of solitary confinement. I was over 50 years old and had been incident free for almost 20 years. During the ride, I imagined myself having a job and being able to have contact visits with my family. Instead, I was placed in conditions that were worse than those at Leavenworth. At that time, I lost hope of ever getting out of solitary confinement. This lawsuit has given me a little hope that my decades of clear conduct may be recognized. But even now, I am not hoping for much. I would like to be able to eat a meal with someone else occasionally. I would like to have a visit with family that ends in being able to hug my daughter goodbye and to shake my son's hand. 
I know that I have sacrificed most of my rights by virtue of my actions as a much younger man. But I think that these things are not too much to hope for, even in my circumstances. <laughs> I was born on February 4th, 1952, and grew up in Long Beach, California. My parents separated when I was a very young, and I was adopted by my stepfather. My parents were middle class, but my home was an angry and violent place. It was not a safe place for a child or for anyone else. My mother became verbally abusive and physically violent when she was angry. She lashed out at me often and would hit me with anything she had in her hands at the time. From a belt to a lamp to a rolling pin, once she threw a kitchen knife at my head. Not only did she hit me and my sister, but my mother also would hit my stepfather when she was angry with him. There was constant physical aggression in my home. My mother's lesson was that the only way to be strong was to be violent. She believed this. Once, after I was beaten up by another kid, my mother told me that if I didn't stand up and fight for myself the next time this happened, she would take the belt to me herself when I got home. I was miserable at home and also very confused. I began to run away. Eventually, these runaways ended up with me being placed in juvenile offender centers. These two turned out to be dangerous places full of people who harmed those they thought were weaker than themselves. There, I learned the single most important survival skill was to stand up for myself so that people didn't think I was weak and prey upon me. By the time I was 19, I had landed in San Quentin prison on an armed robbery charge. When I was released on parole, I fell back into the same behavior. After that, I was soon arrested for a robbery I committed with my biological father and my cousin, Gerald Hall. I was 23 then, when I was sentenced to 15 years for that robbery, my share of the proceeds was a few hundred dollars. My life on the outside was over, forever. When I entered San Quentin, the prison system was unstable and there were regular race riots. However, it was not long before I finished my state time and was transferred to federal custody at United States Penitentiary Leavenworth. Life inside USP Leavenworth was strictly divided on racial lines. Newcomers had to be careful not to show any weakness or word would get around that guys could take advantage of you. Because of the violence, I believed it was necessary to align myself with others for my own safety. In November 1980, I was charged with and convicted of the murder of a fellow inmate, Danny Atwell. I am innocent of this crime, and the conviction was subsequently reversed. CUS versus Silverstein, 737F2D864, 10th Circuit. 1984. At the evidentiary hearing before this case was reversed, the main witness against me, a prisoner who had benefited greatly from his testimony, admitted that he lied and recanted his testimony. Unfortunately, this information only came out after I had already been transferred to the control unit in USP Marion. The control unit in any prison is the most punitive and restrictive part of the prison. This had special meaning in Marion, which was the highest security most restrictive federal prison at the time. It was known among inmates that Marion was built to replace the old Alcatraz Penitentiary. Prisoners from across the country who were hard to house were sent there, and it soon became one of the most violent prisons in the system. Fights, riots, and assaults on prisoners and staff occurred regularly. There was a significant conflict between the staff and prisoners at Marion. Even in the control unit, it was extremely dangerous. Prisoners were armed with homemade knives or had access to obtaining weapons at all times. It's hard to explain how it felt to feel afraid that you could be killed essentially at any moment. Even in their individual cells, prisoners were not safe. I feared attacks on my life at all times from both prisoners and staff. The pressure to stand up for myself and not allow others to perceive me as weak was immense. Prisoners continued to be killed even in the solitary and extreme conditions. In 1982, I was convicted in the death of inmate Robert Chappelle, a murderer I was not guilty of. A murder I was not guilty of. I pled innocent and maintain my innocence to this day. I never knew Chappelle and had never even spoken to him, and I had no responsibility for his death. The fact that I was alleged to have been responsible, however, created an additional set of dangers for me at Marion. After the death of Chappelle, the BOP transferred inmate Robert Cadillac Smith to Marion. Though I had never before heard of Cadillac Smith, 
I learned that he had been friends with Chappelle. Soon after his arrival, Cadillac Smith began making it known that he planned to kill me to avenge Chappelle's death. Despite these threats, the BOP housed Cadillac Smith within three cells of me at Marion. Since I had killed Chappelle, I had nothing against Cadillac Smith prior to his arrival, but I became very apprehensive about him once these threats began. I am aware that the BOP now claims Cadillac Smith was the leader of a DC gang, but at the time, I did not know of this or even of a gang called the DC Blacks. I only learned that the BOP claims that the BOP claims that Cadillac Smith was the leader of the DC Blacks when I read Pete Early's book about 10 years after I was housed in Marion. Cadillac Smith attempted to kill me on two separate occasions between December 1981 and September 1982, once with a homemade zip gun that thankfully failed to fire, and a second time with a knife. Even though the BOP officials were aware of his attempt to take my life and put him into the hole because of it, the BOP later returned him to my same unit and didn't take any action to make me safe. When he returned, Cadillac Smith continued to tell me and others that he was going to kill me. Believing that Cadillac Smith would not stop until he succeeded in killing me and seeing that the BOP was not going to take any measures to help protect me, I killed Cadillac Smith on September 27, 1982. Although at the time I believed I was acting in self-defense, I deeply regret my actions. I am very sorry for the pain I have caused the Smith family. After I killed Smith, I lived in constant fear of reprisals. It was in this state of mind and believing I was in a life-threatening situation that on October 22, 1983, I killed Officer Klutz. I regret my actions and I'm so sorry for the death of Officer Klutz. I am also deeply sorry for the pain I have caused the Klutz family. Even writing this declaration, I feel my words of regret are inadequate to explain the remorse I feel and how much I am sorry for these actions. On November 2nd, 1983, I was transferred without notice to USP Atlanta pending my trial. When I arrived at Atlanta, I had no idea what kind of conditions I was going to be held in or how long I was going to be there. Although I did not know it at the time, the director of the BOP, Normal Carlson, issued a memorandum ordering I be imprisoned under special security measures. These special measures included an order that I be placed under no human contact status indefinitely. The officers took this order seriously. They never spoke to me unless there was no way to avoid it. They spoke only to give me orders. When I spoke to them, they ignored me. I was confined to a special part of the prison known as the side pocket. The side pocket contained three adjacent cells, one of which was a shower. I was rotated between the cells. Apparently this was for security though no one else was housed in or even came into the side pocket. The side pocket was incredibly isolated. I was deep underground and there were no windows in the side pocket. The side pocket cells measured approximately six feet by seven feet, almost exactly the size of a standard king mattress. The cell was so small that I could stand in one place and touch both walls simultaneously. The ceiling was so low that I could reach up and touch the hot light fixture. My bed took up the length of the cell, and there was no other furniture at all. There was no desk. There was no chair. There was no place to store clothing on, or anything at all. I could lie down, I could sit on my bed, or I could stand. When lying down, I could easily touch both ends of the cell, one end with my head, the other end with my feet. The walls were solid steel and painted all white. I was permitted to wear underwear, but I was given no other clothing. Shortly after I arrived, the prison staff began construction on the side pocket cell, adding more bars and other security measures to the cell while I was within it. In order not to be burned by sparks and embers while they welded more iron bars across the cell, I had to lie on my bed and cover myself with a sheet. It is hard to describe the horror I experienced during this construction process. As they built new walls around me, it felt like, it felt like I was being buried alive. It was terrifying. During my first year in the side pocket cell, I was completely isolated from the outside world and had no way to occupy my time. I was not allowed to have any social visits, telephone privileges, or reading materials, except the Bible. I was also not allowed to have a television, radio, or tape player. I could speak to no one, 
and there's virtually nothing on which to focus my attention. I was not only isolated, but also disoriented in the side pocket. This was exacerbated by the fact that I wasn't allowed to have a wristwatch or a clock. In addition, the bright artificial lights remained on the cell constantly, increasing my disorientation and making it difficult to sleep. Not only were they constantly illuminated, but those lights buzzed incessantly. The buzzing noise was maddening, as there often were no other sounds at all. This may sound like a small thing, but it was my entire world. Due to the unchanging bright artificial lights and not having a wristwatch or a clock, I couldn't tell if it was day or night. Frequently, I would fall asleep, and when I woke up, I would not know if I had slept for five minutes or five hours, and I would have no idea of what day or time of day it was. I tried to measure the passing of days by counting food trays. Without being able to keep track of time, though, sometimes I thought the officers had left me and were never coming back. I thought they were gone for days and I was going to starve. It's likely they were only gone for a few hours, but I had no way to know. I was so disoriented in Atlanta that I felt like I was in an episode of the Twilight Zone. I now know that I was housed there for about four years, but I would have believed it was a decade if that is what I was told. It seemed eternal and endless and immeasurable. Throughout my time in Atlanta, I was never fed a hot meal. There was no air conditioning or heating in the side pocket cells. During the summer, the heat was unbearable. I would pour water on the ground and lay naked on the floor in an attempt to cool myself. The bright lights made the heat worse. It felt like I was in an oven. The only time I was let out of my cell was for outdoor recreation. I was allowed one hour a week of outdoor recreation. I could not see any other inmates or any of the surrounding landscape during outdoor recreation. There was no exercise equipment and nothing to do. I was only allowed one hour of indoor recreation within the side pocket cell, four times a week. My vision deteriorated in the side pocket, I think due to the constant bright lights, or possibly also because of the other aspects of this harsh environment. Everything began to appear blurry and I became sensitive to light, which burned my eyes and gave me headaches. Nearly all of the time, the officers refused to speak to me. Despite this, I heard people who I believed to be officers whispering into my vents telling me they hated me and calling me names. To this day, I'm not sure if the officers were doing this to me or if I was starting to lose it, and these were hallucinations. In the side pocket cell, I lost some ability to distinguish what was real. I dreamt I was in prison. When I woke up, I was not sure which was reality and which was a dream. For the first six months before a camera was installed in the hallway in front of my cell, I was watched by two officers at all times. I found this extremely uncomfortable. It felt like a physical violation to know that these people watched from close proximity every little thing I did, even my bodily functions. They would not talk to me, but they talked to each other at all hours. This made me agitated and I couldn't sleep. My correspondence was strictly limited to my immediate family and my attorneys. However, I had fallen out of touch with most of my family. So during this time, I only wrote to my sister. I was not allowed paper in my cell and had to ask for it when I wanted to write. I was limited to five sheets each week and given a three-inch pencil for my correspondence. Before being transferred to Marion, when I was at Leavenworth, I had become interested in art and I had taught myself to draw. I used art to express myself and also to prevent my mind from deteriorating. However, in the side pocket, I was prohibited for the entire first year from having any art supplies at all. After the first year in the side pocket, I was gradually allowed basic privileges, including a radio and some art supplies. When I was finally allowed to have art supplies, the relief was enormous. I used the opportunity to order art books and taught myself to paint. Finally, I had a little something to break up the enduring monotony of my days. When I was allowed to have a radio, I began listening to religious services on Sunday afternoons. During my time in Atlanta, I had no opportunity to discuss my conditions with anyone. And to my knowledge, my placement in solitary confinement was never reviewed. This caused me to worry that I would be kept in the side pocket cell forever. I never knew what I could do to make any of my conditions better. During this time, I became very interested in Buddhism and the Buddhist philosophy. I had requested a Bible and enrolled in correspondence Bible study courses. When I first arrived at Atlanta, however, over time, I found a greater sense of connection to the Buddhist teachings on the radio. I had previously practiced yoga when I was at Marion, but in the side pocket cell, my yoga practice became a defining aspect of my life. 
It took on a spiritual aspect that I had never experienced before. Yoga allowed me to exercise both my body and my mind, in spite of being confined in such a tiny cage. It brought me a feeling of peace, at least occasionally. The 1987 riots at USP Atlanta and my transfer to USP Leavenworth. In 1987, Cuban inmates at Atlanta rioted and seized control of the prison, taking prison staff hostage. Because I was isolated in the side pocket cell, I was unaware of the riot until I heard an unusual noise. I had become accustomed to the familiar sounds of officers' footsteps and keys clanging, but this was different, and it was much louder. I was initially worried for my own safety when I saw the Cuban, inmate, Cuban inmates enter the side pocket area. However, the inmates did not harm me, but released me from the side pocket cell. I was ecstatic to be out of solitary confinement. I freely roamed the yard and slept outside under the stars for the only time in the last 28 years. The riot lasted seven days, and during that time I was free to move about the prison and interact with other people. I harmed no one. Instead, during the riot, I was in contact with several members of the prison staff and actively protected two staff members from harm. When I saw an elderly correctional officer having a heart attack, I persuaded the other rioters to let him out so he could receive medical attention. I also went out of my way to take care of an officer I knew, bringing him extra food and making sure no one harassed him. This man had made sure that I received all of my food when I was isolated. While items were often missing when the officers brought my tray, I was glad to be able to show him some kindness in return. I also checked on Lieutenant Howington and made sure he was safe and being treated respectfully. I had always appreciated how Lieutenant Howington used to ask if my cuffs were too tight or painful, when most of the other officers refused to speak to me at all. Although I was unaware of this at the time, I later learned that the FBI and the BOP negotiated with the Cuban rioters to turn me over as a gesture of goodwill. The Cuban inmates drugged me, seized me, and carried me out of the prison. As they were taking me out, I begged them to kill me so that I wouldn't have to return to extreme solitary confinement. The Cubans ignored my pleas and threw my body over the fence where BOP officials were waiting to take control of me. Once in BOP custody, correctional officers cuffed my hands behind my back. They shackled my ankles and locked me in a cell. I was not allowed out of my shackles for any reason, even to relieve myself. I was kept in the cell all night and begged the officers to uncuff me so I could use, so I could use the toilet. The pain of holding my bladder was excruciating. Finally, when I just couldn't hold back any longer and it was clear that I was not going to be let out of the cell or unhandcuffed, I voided in my pants. The next morning, I was escorted into a van where I was forced to sit in my own urine on the trip to Kansas. I kept asking the officers if I could use the bathroom and they just replied that I should hold it, even though they knew that this wasn't possible. Throughout the trip, I was never allowed to use the restroom and so was forced to urinate on myself again. I felt like an animal being transported, being forced to wear the handcuffs and void on myself was degrading and extremely painful. When the cuffs were finally removed, I had extensive bruising. Two of my toenails fell off, I think from the lack of circulation. When I finally arrived at the new prison, I learned I was at USP Leavenworth. I was not allowed to wash myself until I was placed in a special cell in the basement. This happened on December 1st, 1987. I thought that maybe after seeing that I was not violent, even when I had the chance during the riot, the BOP would start to lessen my restrictions. But I was wrong. I was crushed when I saw my new cell in the Leavenworth basement. To get to the basement cell, numerous officers in protective armor escorted me down a small elevator to the basement. And through an underground tunnel in the 85-year-old building, it felt like going into a dungeon. On the day I arrived at Leavenworth, Associate Warden Smith visited my cell. Smith had been Correctional Officer Klutz's friend. He was now in charge of my confinement. He told me that I was going to do all, he told me that he was going to do all he could to prevent me from seeing the light of day and that I deserved everything I was getting. Indeed, I didn't see the light of day for a long time. I did not receive any recreation at all for nearly a year at Leavenworth. Instead, prison staff slowly began adding more bars and constructing an adjacent visiting booth and an indoor recreation area so that I would never have to leave the basement. The structure of the basement itself was similar to the side pocket cell in USP Atlanta. The cell area was approximately nine foot by 16 foot and contained a bed, desk, a metal sink, shower stall, TV, shower and toilet without a lid. Soon after I arrived, they installed several, ca several cameras into the basement. 
After this, I was kept under camera surveillance 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Knowing that I was constantly being watched, even while using the toilet or taking a shower, was embarrassing and made me extremely anxious. One of the cameras installed right over the toilet. I have suffered from serious hemorrhoids for as long as I can remember. It was humiliating to know the officers were likely talking about me and mocking me as I tried to blot the blood flowing from my rear. Below was my artistic rendering of the camera's placement in relation to my toilet, how I felt being watched. The cell was brightly lit at all times, and I was told this was in order for the cameras to show a clear picture. Sometimes the BOP would even put us on a spotlight and shine it on me, directly blinding me. There was nothing I could do to stop the light. With the light on and all the time, I never slept more than four or five hours. This was made even worse by the fact that there was no window. As in the side pocket, my body could not tell whether it was night or day. Additionally, my vision continued to deteriorate, and sometimes I would have hallucinations where the bars on the cell moved or I saw different shapes. The privileges my good behavior had earned me in USP Atlanta were taken from me in Leavenworth, including my art supplies. In the absence of human contact, my art had become central to my identity. It was almost the only way I knew I was alive, that I had existed. No one spoke to me, but I felt that I was able to communicate, that I was a living human being by making art. Without it, I felt like a part of my soul had been taken from me. I was not allowed a razor or any means of cutting my hair for six months upon arriving in Leavenworth. When I was finally permitted to use a razor, my beard and hair were so long that it was not of much use, so I did not bother. I did not have access to a mirror. Only years later, when I asked to see a photo of myself, could I see what I looked like. I didn't recognize the person underneath the overgrown head of hair and unkept beard. The basement cell completely isolated me from all other inmates. I never saw or heard any sign of any other prisoners. It is hard to convey how strange it is to be this isolated in prison, to see and hear no sign of other prisoners. Prisons are generally noisy and filled with the sounds of other prisoners. Proximity with others is typically a defining characteristic of prison. Yet in the basement cell, I lived in what seemed a post-apocalyptic solitary state. I felt utterly alone. The basement cell also minimized my contact with staff. The two officers who were outside my cell never spoke directly to me. At the same time, just like in Atlanta, their conversations and blaring music tormented me and kept me up at all hours. Sometimes they would put a phone just outside of my cell and would call it on purpose so that it would ring and ring for hours just to torment me. I often received fewer than three meals a day and I ate every meal alone. I was not allowed any recreation privileges and never left my cell. For approximately my first year in the basement, I had no hot water and was forced to take cold showers. I only received hot water after LVN staff realized I could not adequately clean my cell. The scum in my shower grew so thick I wrote the word freedom in it using my finger. When staff ordered me to wash the word off, I explained that I had no hot water to use for cleaning. Thus, for the purpose of cleaning my graffiti, I was finally allowed hot water. At first, I was not permitted any art supplies. I filed grievances about this which were denied all the way up to the BP-11, the highest level. After a year in the basement cell, my art supplies were finally returned to me. I believe the reason I received them back was because an outsider, the writer Pete Early, was in the prison and asked the warden why I was not allowed art supplies. Below was the first picture I drew once my art supplies were returned. It shows a man prostate, depleted and defeated. I think the work speaks for itself. The basement cell was infested with vermin. I often woke to find rats and cockroaches crawling in my hair and beard. Despite this, I became careful not to injure my fellow basement dwellers because they were my only companions. In addition, because I was learning and studying Buddhism, Buddhism, I began thinking of and valuing life in a different way. I felt like my head was in constant fog when I was in the basement cell. I was never tired enough to sleep and yet lacked energy to do anything. During my time in the basement, I never left my cell. I did not breathe fresh air or glimpse any sunlight. In that whole time, I did not touch another person and no one touched me, not even the officers, as I was never allowed to leave my cell. I actually began to feel and think of myself like a leper or some other untouchable, as if I were not fit to be around people because I would infect anyone I came into contact with. The only time anyone spoke to me was during occasional rounds made by administrators, religious chaplains, and a monthly visit from the prison psychologist. These interactions typically lasted only a matter of seconds. I received no reviews for the 18 months I was held in the basement cell. 
on a rare occasion when someone would visit my cell. I would ask about what I could do to get out of solitary. They always responded that they were just checking to see that I was receiving meals, recreation, and appropriate programming. I was always told that they had no authority to change the conditions of my confinement and that I needed to speak with the warden. After approximately 18 months in the basement cell and without notice, I was chained and shackled to a wheelchair and escorted to a new cell. The new cell previously known as the Hole was in the same building as the Leavenworth Special Housing Unit, SHU. The officers ironically named this cell the Silverstein Suite. Even though I was technically in the SHU, I could not see or hear any other prisoners. The area where I was held, housed was accessible by separate entrance. Even when I listened at the vent, I could not hear anything. Yet sometimes pepper gas would come through my vents and would burn my eyes and throat. For a long time, I thought the officer sprayed the gas in the vent just to cause me pain. Later, however, I figured out that the gas was coming through when it, when it was used on prisoners in the shoe. In the Silverstein suite, I remained on no human contact status and continued to be isolated. The Silverstein suite consisted of a cell area, an area devoted to conducting strip searches and recreation areas, one outdoor and one indoor. The indoor recreation area was also used as a visiting area. The areas were separated by solid steel doors. To move between areas, prison staff would remotely open those to allow me to pass through. The outdoor recreation area was approximately 17 by 14 six and surrounded by 20 foot high concrete walls. The sky above the walls was blocked by a roof built out of two sets of wire bars and mesh. I could see nothing of the surrounding landscape or even the sky from the outdoor recreation area. In the Silverstein suite, I was allowed to exercise one hour a day, five days a week in the outdoor recreation area. Sometimes I was left in the outdoor recreation area for extended periods of time during the winter in the bitter cold, snow or rain. The indoor recreation area was opposite the outdoor recreation and strip search areas. It was approximately nine by 16 foot and contained a broken stationary bike, a concrete stool, intercom, and a glass barred window that looked out into a visiting booth. Two surveillance cameras watched everything I did in the Silverstein suite, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I imagined eyes on me at all the time. As I moved out around the cell, the cameras would make a buzzing noise as they had readjusted to see me. Again, it was humiliating to have to go to the bathroom and treat my hemorrhoids, knowing the camera was always on me. During my time in the Silverstein suite, I was always alone. I exercised alone and took all my meals alone. Lights remained on 24 hours a day, seven days a week in the Silverstein suite. A year or two before I was transferred from Leavenworth to ADX, the prison installed a switch that allowed me to turn off the light in my cell. However, I still could not make it fully dark as the light in the hall remained on 24 hours a day. Initially, I was only allowed one phone call a month. However, my phone privileges increased over time. And by 2001, I was allowed about 300 minutes a month. Below was a drawing I made while I was in the Silver Scene Suite that depicts how I made telephone calls. During my time in the Silver Scene Suite, prison psychology staff conducted drive-by visits, pausing only briefly at my cell before moving on. When my psychologist, Dr. Denny, came to speak, it would generally only be for a few minutes, and these conversations always happened through a solid steel door. Often he didn't come at all, and later I learned that he conducted a psychological review by watching me on the cameras that constantly filmed me. I often expressed hopelessness and depression to the psychologist. I desperately tried to explain that my poor emotional state grew directly from my solitary confinement. I told Dr. Denny about how I couldn't sleep and how I was losing my memory. I asked him to help me, and I asked him to test me. However, Dr. Denny refused to take any action. He told me my feelings and symptoms were normal for someone in these conditions. But I had the impression that he thought that he would lose his job if he intervened or recommended that I be removed from solitary confinement. He would tell me, I have a family to feed. Later, when I saw the reports, I discovered he didn't even write down much of what I told him. After numerous failed attempts to get Dr. Denny to help me, I concluded it was pointless to continue. So I stopped talking to most of the psychology staff altogether. It was frustrating to express my vulnerability to someone who would not change his response no matter how I was doing. On rare occasions, about twice a year, I had reviews with people other than Dr. Denny. I saw Ms. Ashman more frequently but definitely not more than a few times every couple of months or so. In order to attend these reviews, I was chained to a wheelchair and escorted to the meetings, which were held only a few feet from my cell. There in these reviews, I always inquired about what I needed to do to get out of solitary confinement. In response, administrators, including the case manager, the region representative, and the warden, informed me that they were not there to make decisions about my confinement or placement. 
but simply to see that I was getting meals, recreation, and mail, and discouraged me from continuing to ask questions about my confinement. After many years of these reviews without any change in conditions, I saw no point in attending, so I began refusing to attend. At this point, administrators began coming to my cell door to conduct, to conduct the reviews, which continued to be meaningless for me. During the years I was in the Silverstein suite, I almost never was taken out of my cell. On the rare occasion that I was taken out, I was escorted by many correctional officers in riot gear. Buddhism and yoga helped me deal with my conditions and simultaneously helped me change as a person. I learned all that I can control is my reactions to what happens and that no matter how hard I try, I can't control other people. Though I still suffered when the BOP failed to move me to less restrictive conditions year after year, despite my good behavior, I tried to control my reactions to this inaction. In addition, practicing yoga helped calm my anxiety and helped me develop a greater sense of inner peace. I spent the next 15 years in the Silverstein suite, with two short stints back in the basement cell when the suite needed to be painted or otherwise maintained. On July 15, 2005, without any, notice, without any notice or explanation, I was transferred to the Administrative Maximum Penitentiary in Florence, Colorado. No one ever talked to me about transferring to ADX, so I was unaware this was going to happen until the very morning the transfer took place. The day of my transfer, I awoke at 5 in the morning to a bunch of officers in full protective gear outside my cell. I figured out quickly that this meant I was going to be moved. I was taken to a van where I was shuffled from the one cage to the next. The entire way I was hoping this transfer meant change for the better. I soon realized it was not. When we arrived at ADX, I was immediately taken to the hospital and x-rayed. I was then hustled through the long sterile corridors with floors that gleamed. We passed through door after door until finally we arrived at range 13. Range 13 is located on Z unit, which is part of the shoe at ADX. I continued to be held on no human contact status on range 13 the most restrictive housing unit and the most restrictive federal, federal penitentiary in the country. I would, have, I would not have thought this was possible, but in range 13, the conditions were even worse than Leavenworth. My cell was even smaller and I lost many of the privileges that helped me endure the isolation, like art supplies and phone calls. There are four cells on range 13. I was re rotated between two cells every three months. There was only one other person held on range 13. After 22 years of not being able to speak to another inmate, I was excited to have the opportunity to talk to anyone. Even though we had to shout to each other and it was difficult to hear what the other person said back, it was still nice to be able to hear your own voice in conversation and a friendly voice replying. However, the officers ordered us not to talk to each other and even threatened us with a disciplinary report if we did talk. Pretty quickly after my arrival, a solid steel door was built in the hallway to further separate us and prevent us from being able to even shout to each other. In some ways, Knowing someone else was nearby and in similar conditions made me feel better. Just knowing there was someone else who understood a little bit of what I went through each day made me feel better somehow. The cells on range 13 were 8 by 6 by 10, almost half of the size of my cell in Leavenworth. Each contained a cement bed with metal restraint rings, a cement desk, sink, toilet, and shower. In one cell, the walls were cement, and I had a mirror and a small horizontal window near the ceiling that I could look out of if I stood on my desk. I could only see the concrete barriers of the outdoor workout area. I couldn't even see the sky. In the other cell, the walls were made of steel and there was no mirror. There was a window. However, I couldn't see out the window because it was covered in mesh that had been painted over, making it difficult even for light to shine in. Even though I could dim my cell light, I could never turn it completely off. In addition, the lights in the sally ports of both cells were on 24 hours a day. I was still continuously monitored by video surveillance cameras. Being watched all the time made me feel like I lived in a petri dish, like I'm the bacteria under the BOP's microscope. I used to become extremely apprehensive whenever I heard the officers thrust the grill gate key into the lock to enter range 13. The noise from unlocking the gate isn't very loud, but I had become extremely sensitive to noises. Many of the privileges that I had been given over time at Leavenworth were denied at ADX. For example, my phone time was decreased from 300 minutes a month to two 15-minute phone calls a month and I was no longer allowed to send art out to many people who I corresponded with by mail. I was not given any explanation for my limited ability to communicate with people. I was being further restricted. I was also deprived of all art supplies except a pencil and paper. I take my art very seriously, and being an artist is what defines me. So it was extremely difficult to find myself suddenly without my art supplies. 
I felt as if a significant piece of me was missing. In December 2007, almost two and a half, after almost two and a half years, a very limited amount of art supplies were returned to me, for which I am very thankful. However, even to this day, I am still limited to only six watercolors, and I'm not allowed, allowed any other types of paint, which I had access to in Lebanon. On range 13, I was allowed to use one of the two outdoor recreation areas which were connected to the cell via remote operated doors. The outdoor recreation area was a concrete pit surrounded by high featureless walls on all sides. It felt like being inside of a deep empty swimming pool. I couldn't see any of the mountains, even though I know they had to be close. I also couldn't see a single tree, a blade of grass, or any sign of nature. I also was allowed to use an indoor recreation area which was connected to the cells via remote operated doors. I generally received one hour of recreation time five days a week. The recreation areas were so small that I could walk no more than 10 steps in either direction and 30 steps in a circle. There was no equipment in the recreation areas. During the time I was confined on Rage 13, I ate every meal alone in my cell and exercised by myself. My meals were usually late and almost always cold. Every 30 days, the psychology staff would conduct a mental health interview, which usually lasted only minutes. This meeting took place by talking through the solid steel door. This picture is a true and accurate representation of the steel door through which my mental health interviews took place. Except for a single week during the Atlanta prison riot, I have lived continuously in a solitary confinement for the past 28 years. Other than infrequent haircuts, infrequent haircuts, strip searches and medical examinations, the only physical human contact I have experienced in the 28 years is when BOP officers handcuff me and escort me. For 28 years, I have been isolated from other inmates. At the time of his death, it had been 38 years. On rare occasions, I've been able to communicate with my peers by yelling through prison walls, but I have had no meaningful contact. For 35 years, my visitor list has been restricted to family members and people I knew before I was incarcerated. Not only have I lost touch with nearly everyone I knew while on the outside, but I have been kept far from family, making visits difficult and rare. For 28 years, I have eaten every meal alone in my cell. For 28 years, I have been entombed in, a con in concrete and steel and have not enjoyed anything even remotely resembling open space. I'm barely even allowed outside. When outside, I am surrounded by 20 foot high walls that allow me to view no more than a sliver of sky and nothing of the surrounding landscape. The mental anguish of 28 years of solitary confinement is worse than any physical pain I've ever suffered or imagined. The indefiniteness of my confinement makes, me men makes my mental suffering never ending. After 28 years without much environmental stimulation, I fear that my mental state is deteriorating. I have difficulty remembering certain words and I feel that I cannot always accurately express what I am trying to communicate. My mind is always in a fog. I hear what people are saying but I can't always understand them and have trouble focusing for more than a few minutes. I often have to watch my educational program several times because I miss important details and misinterpret what I hear. I'm listening, but not hearing. Sometimes I have hallucinations where I see human shadows outside my cell window. I know they can't be real because my cell is on the second floor. Often I perceive the floors of my cell change, fluctuating from light to dark. At other times, people's faces become distorted and frightening. There is no end to the monotony of my days. Each day is the same as the one before and the one after. The tedium of my days saps any motivation I might have. I am anxious all the time. I'm given medication for my anxiety, but it doesn't help. Instead, the medicine side effects make me feel drowsy and tired during the day. I have trouble sleeping. I never sleep more than four or five hours a night. When I do sleep, my dreams are of being held in solitary confinement. 28 years of solitary confinement has taken a physical toll on me. I often have trouble breathing, which may be related to my anxiety. My eyesight is worsening and I have trouble getting in to see the eye doctor. I also think my muscles are beginning to atrophy. I receive a little recreation five days a week, but other than that, I spend most of my day laying in bed or sitting at my desk. There's not much space for movement in my cell. I have hepatitis C. While I've been told for over a year that I qualify for treatment, I'm still waiting to receive it. When I ask why I don't receive it, I inform that there's a very long waiting list. The experience of being utterly alone in a tiny cell for nearly three decades has caused me emotional despair and has caused me to deteriorate physically as well. Though I know that I want to live and always have been a survivor, I have often wished for death. I know though, I don't want to die. 
What I want is a life in prison that I can't fill with some meaning, that I can fill with some meaning. I have changed so much in behavior and outlook from the person that I was 28 years ago. I have no interest in violence. I have devoted the past 26 years to Buddhism and practicing meditation and yoga. I enjoy listening to the tapes and watching programs hosted by the Dalai Lama. I've been a vegetarian for many years now for both health and spiritual reasons. I receive letters sometimes from people telling me I'm a monster. They think because of what I did that I don't have any emotions or feelings. I can see why they think that, but it's not true. I feel very deeply about the terrible pain I have caused others. I hate what I did and I hate being forever defined by those actions. As horrible as my actions were and as awful as their consequences are, I am still a human being. I am not just a killer. I am also a father, a brother, and a friend. I try to find meaning in my life and to be of value to others. I have also developed my artistic talent as a constructive means of self-expression. For 28 years, I have been a model prisoner. I have done everything the BOP has asked me, asked of me, yet I am repeatedly denied an orderly position and placement in the step-down program. Getting out of solitary confinement will relieve the relentless and crushing strain that has worn away my mind, my body, my spirit for 28 years. After 28 years of solitary confinement, including over 22 years of clear conduct, I hope for and think I deserve a chance to progress with the step-down program. That was most of Thomas Silverstein's declaration. That was his declaration, and some people might say, you know what, fuck that guy. That guy deserved everything that he got. But if you're one of those people saying that, then I think that you should consider that perhaps that could be your father. Perhaps that could be your mother. Perhaps that could be you, or a son, or a cousin, or an uncle. Locked away in a cell. Treated like shit, man. He did some very wicked things. Did he deserve to be around people? Was he rehabilitated? We say we're a nation that believes in second chances, but are we? And for those of you that don't understand the monster that the BOP is, or that the monster that the BOP has become, or always has been, this is what they do, man. They suppress, they oppress, they devastate. They treat you like you're shit, man. Like you're nothing. They'll take your food. They'll destroy your cell. They'll put their hands on you. They'll throw your mail away. They'll throw your pictures away. They'll put you in a position where someone could kill you when they know that you have a beef with this person or a position where you would kill them. They do it all the time. You might have a loved one in federal prison right now and he's getting transferred from prison to prison because he has issues with certain gangs, right? Because he's been assaulted from prison to prison. This could be your son. Thomas Silverstein took his last breath. Took his last breath at the age of 67 years old on May 11, 2019. The BOP had done everything they could do. Everything they could do to break a man. The real question is, did they break him? Some of you might ask, was his declaration bullshit or was it real? I'm here to tell you that I believe it was real. And I believe it was real because I understand that people change, that people evolve, that people learn and they change their character. I was one of those people, man. I wasn't as vicious as this guy. I didn't kill people in prison. But I wasn't always a nice guy. It took time. It took rehabilitation. It took education. It took understanding. It took learning what empathy was and compassion. It took time. I don't know how he did it, man. All those years in solitary confinement, I have to be honest with you. I probably wouldn't have lasted 25% of the time that he did. Blood on the razor wire TV, man. From Tommy Silverstein's words. From his mouth to your ears. With respect until tomorrow, we're out.